a party announcement. 40 Very seconds. Very quickly, go ahead. Okay, folks, come on in. Please get settled in. This is it. Is that, is that okay? Take care. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, hey everyone, a uh, quick announcement. Uh, we're with uh, Lava and we're just promoting the Lava Party. It's going to be a great time. You can get your tickets. Thank you. You can get your tickets in uh, the lobby at noon, uh, both days, and tomorrow at Beer Blast. Anyway, this is our president. I'm the VP of Translations. Our president just has a few words to say. Bom dia. Pessoal, vocês precisam vir para Lava Party. Essa quinta-feira vai ser um muito bacana. Bebida liberada, gente bonita, gente dançando. <risos> Oportunidade perfeita para você dançar aquele gatinho com aquela gatinha. Então venham todos, vocês não vão não vão se arrepender, tá bom? Espero todos vocês lá. He just said uh, it's going to be fun. Thank you. The moon is going to be there. Right. <laughs> Okay, folks, so you can call me the compassionate one, because that could have been a lot worse, right? I actually wrote three versions of the quiz before I settled on that one. It's actually interesting. There are um, words you can leave out of a quiz that can make the quiz much more difficult, okay? Let's take the second question. You'd never seen something like that on a previous quiz, right? But you know how I helped you out? What, what do the questions start with? APV. Using the APV method. So basically all you had to do is go through your lecture notes looking for the word APV <laughs> and you were there. Which is, so it's a joint test of did you bring your lecture notes with you? <laughs> which some of you did not. And second, can you find stuff in your lecture note packet? Which is kind of tough to do. Hey. But actually if I hadn't used those words, I could have actually made the prom a lot more difficult because you'd have had no idea where to even look. So, usual rules apply, I will grade the quizzes. I know one, one of your quizzes looked like it was out of nine. It was actually, the third prom was actually three points for some reason when I was writing the quizzes. So don't worry, I will grade you out of ten points, you know, no matter which quiz you took. They were actually exactly the same types of proms, the numbers were different, okay? So, as soon as the quizzes are done, I will let you know. Unfortunately, I will not be able to return them tomorrow because I'll be in Chicago. By Friday, you should get the quizzes, so if you can't wait until Friday, tough. <laughs> Nothing you can do about it, eh? but they will be out by Friday morning. Okay? So let's pick up where we left off on Monday. We were talking about how much a company can afford to pay in dividends, and I measured what I call a free cash flow equity. So I decided to redo the page because that page is a little messy, so I thought of maybe if I presented it differently, it would connect better. So remember what the free cash flow equity is. It's potential dividend. It's cash left over after every conceivable need. So I'll give you the standard definition. Here's what you do. You start with net income. Why? Because you're an equity investor. That's your measure of income. You add back depreciation and amortization. Why do you do that? Because it's a non-cash expense for the same reasons we added back when we did cash flows. You subtract out capital expenditures, you subtract out working capital needs, you subtract out preferred dividends. You're writing checks out because you're the equity investor. What you get when you, when you subtract those out is the free cash or equity before you even look at debt. This is what Warren Buffett calls owner's earnings. So if any of you are big time value investors, Buffett likes this measure of looking at companies. Rather than look at the net income, he says, 
we should look at what's left over after you reinvest. But I'm going to take an extra step. If you're a growing company, it is not just conceivable, but likely that some of your reinvestment is going to be funded with debt. Not because you're trying to do something rash, but as you're growing, you can afford to borrow more money. So when you borrow money, think of what hap happens. Cash comes into the company. So when you take on new debt, cash comes into the company. When you repay debt, cash leaves the company. So if you take those cash flows and supplement them to your free cash flow equity before debt cash flows, you end up with your potential dividend. That's a standard defini definition. There are seven line items there. And one of the things I've discovered when you do valuation is the more line items you have, the easier it is to disconnect from what you're doing. So I decided to consolidate. I'm a great believer in aggregating things. So I took that definition and rewrote it. Some of you fi might find this even more confusing, but I find it more useful. I'm going to start with net income, just like I did before. Then I'm going to take those three items, capex, depreciation, and change in working capital, and consolidate them. CapEx minus depreciation is called net CapEx. It's what you're putting into your assets to increase them. Change in working capital is what you're investing in short-term assets. You consolidate them. What you get is called reinvestment. It's what you're putting back into the business. And why do you want to do that? Why do you want to put money back into your business? What do you hope to get in return? What's the trade-off here? You expect to get growth. So this in, becomes the way you think about growth. So from the net income, I'm setting aside reinvestment. So that becomes those, that consolidated item. And from the free cash flow equity, I get this net debt cash flow from debt being issued and debt repaid. So same definition, just rewritten. I'm going to make it even simpler. And this is only in the special case where you as a company have decided that you're going to borrow a fixed percentage of your reinvestment from debt. Let me explain what I mean. Let's assume you as a company decide that you're going to, from this day on, whatever you reinvest, 30% is going to come from debt, 70% from equity. And at this point, the 30-70 is not arbitrary, right? Because when you did the optimal debt ratio for Disney, it said 40-60. So you believe your optimal, say, from this day on, 40% of what I reinvest comes from debt, the 60% from equity. I can actually rewrite my free cash flow equity in even simpler form. I can take the net income, just like I did in the previous two definitions, and now, instead of subtracting out reinvestment and then netting out the net debt, debt cash flow, I'm going to take my reinvestment and say 70% of that reinvestment is going to come from me. As an equity investor, all I care about is, are my cash flows. And what I'm left with is the free cash flow equity. So the third definition works only if you have a stable and constant debt ratio. The second definition is a more generic definition, the first one is the standard one. And if you do it right, you should get the same numbers at the end using all three. So in the special case where the debt ratio is stable, you can use this approach to come up with your free cash flow equity. And your calculation becomes much simpler. It's net income minus the equity portion of net capex minus the equity portion of change in working capital is your free cash flow equity. But it works only if your debt ratio is stable. So let me try this on Disney going back to 2008. So let me take the 2000, I'm sorry, go, going back to, so you can see 2008 through 2012. Let me take the 2012 numbers so you can see exactly the mechanics of how I'm computing free cash flow equity. So in 2012, Disney had net income of 6,136 million. In fact, if you have the statement of cash flows, statement of cash flows always starts with net income. So I'm pulled that 6,136. It had net capex of 604 million. Notice again, net capex is not capex, it's capex minus depreciation. So it's $604 million more in capex and depreciation. So there's net capex. Their working capital decreased by $133 million. What does that do to your cash flows when working capital decreases? Come on, you couldn't have forgotten capital budgeting already. Working capital goes down, cash flows go up. So the decrease in working capital is a positive cash flow. So if I stop right there, my free cash flow equity before I consider debt is $5.665 billion. Their debt issues exceeded their debt repayments by $1.88 billion. They borrowed $1.88 billion more than they repaid. You add that cash flow on, their free cash flow equity was $7,546 million. In 2012, that's how much cash they could have paid out to equity investors in the form of dividends and buybacks. 
It is true in 2012 they had this big debt issue, so that's why the cash flow is high. So if you're worried about the numbers jumping around, if you use a debt ratio, let's say you decide the debt ratio for Disney is 11.58%, which was the existing debt ratio, the free cash flow to equity would have been much lower. You're saying, why have two free cash flows to equity? Because if I pay out the entire 7.54 billion as dividends, next year I'm not going to be able to borrow as much money, so my free cash flows to equity are going to jump around more. This is more of a smoothed out number. So if you look at the sum total of what I got across the five years, the free cash flow to equity I had across all five years was $27.1 billion. That's including the debt payment, the debt cash flows. What does that mean? Over these five years, Disney could have returned $27.1 billion in the form of dividends and buybacks. What they actually returned over that period was about $19.9 billion. So Disney was returning a lot of cash, but given the amount that they were borrowing, they were actually building up cash balances over the five years. And this is, if you do this for Apple, and I did this on a blog, I think, last year, I computed their free cash flow equity each year for the last five years. You know what the free cash flow equity were over the five years? $300 billion. That's how much cash flow they generated. They returned more cash than any company in history in the form of dividends and buybacks. They returned $245 billion. Guess what happened to their cash balance while they were returning more cash than any other company in history? Their cash balance increased by $55 billion. This isn't rocket science. The way you end up with big cash balances is you consistently hold back free cash flow equity. They're trying. You can't blame them. for. Tr they're trying to give it back, but there's so much cash coming in, they can't give it away fast enough. Companies would kill to have a problem like this. But that's Apple's problem. It's the greatest cash machine known in history. No company's ever generated this much cash this quickly and that's part of the reason you'll see their cash balances continue to build up even as they're buying back stock and even as they're paying dividends. So I'm going to take you back in time to 1996. In 1996, the company that was the cash machine out there was Microsoft. Its cash machine was driven by two engines. One was called Office, the other was called Windows. Basically, the ca you know, cash churning out. Their net income in that year was $2.18 billion. The capex was 494 million, the depreciation was 480 million. Help me out here. Capex is your cash outflow, depreciation is in a sense a cash inflow. Your net capex is almost nothing, right? And this was a growing company. So why is Microsoft's net capex so low if, you're, if they're a growing company? Aren't they supposed to be reinvesting for future growth? There's actually an accounting reason for it. And what's Microsoft's biggest capex? R&D. And what do accountants do with R&D? Treat it as an operating expense. So their biggest capex is actually embedded in their operating expenses. So their net income is actually not net income. It's net income after their biggest capex. So the 14 million is small because your biggest capex you've treated as an expense. So 14 million is the net capex. The working capital increased by 35 million. You subtract 14 and 35 from 2176. They're 2,127 million in free cash flow equity. So here's a mechanical question. Microsoft in 1996 could have returned 2,127 million in the form of dividends and buybacks. They paid no dividends. They bought back no stock. So here's my question. Where would I find that 2,127 million if I was looking on Microsoft's balance sheet? It's got to go somewhere, right? There's a debit credits. It's got to go somewhere. Where would I find it? I was hoping you'd give the, that answer because it's the wrong answer, but I wanted it out there because that's what naturally comes to mind, right? Because that's what we're taught in accounting, earnings minus dividends. But this isn't earnings minus dividends. This is free cash flow equity minus dividends. Look at the other side of the balance sheet. It's true, retain earnings would have gone up by their... No, di what would I find on the other side of the balance sheet? Where would it show up? Let me go I through items and you tell me why it wouldn't show up there. Would it show up in my physical assets? Why not? Because if I invest in physical assets, it'll show up as CapEx, right? 
It's not in R&D because I've already taken out R&D. It's not in inventory or accounts receivable because it have shown up as change in working capital. So almost by exclusion, where, what, what's the only item left in the balance sheet I haven't talked about? My cash balance increased in 1996 by 2,127 million. In 1997, Microsoft had free cash flow equity of three billion, paid no dividends, bought back no stock. So that three billion adds on top of the existing cash balance. You can see how each year you do this, your cash balance is going to accumulate because you're building on top of previous cash balances. By 2003, Microsoft had the largest cash balance in corporate history at that point in time. Of course, it's been eclipsed by companies like Apple. But in 2003, its cash balance had climbed at that time to 50, 60 billion dollars. So you can see how cash balances build up and those cash balances are what you see when you look at a company's balance sheet today. I'm always puzzled when managers of companies look at their balance sheet, oh my God, we have a big cash balance. As if this were manna from heaven that popped on their balance sheet all of a sudden. When you have a large cash balance, it's a direct consequence of decisions you made year after year after year to get to where you are today. Let me do a little tangent here. So we know how to compute the free cash flow equity for a non-financial service company. Take net income minus net capex minus change in working capital, you get free, and then the debt inflows and outflows, you have free cash flow equity. Let's say I gave you a bank. Say, compute the free cash flow equity for JP Morgan. So let's start with the easy item. Can you get the net, net income for JP Morgan? That's not a trick question. Yes, we can get the net income. Then I ask you, what's CapEx for JP Morgan? And you start waving your hands. You say, I have no idea what CapEx is. What's depreciation? What do banks say to depreciate? How about working capital? By some definitions, everything is working capital and nothing is working capital. And after a lot of hand waving, you can say, all I have is net income. I have none of these middle items. Do so you know what a lot of analysts claim the free cash or equity for a bank is? It's net income, which makes absolutely no sense because if you paid your net income out every year, you're not going to be able to grow. And for a long time, I essentially went along with the flow saying, here, yeah, right, you can't get the cash flow. I never bought into the notion that earnings were dividends or earnings were free cash or equity. But starting about 10 years ago, I started thinking about how would I define reinvestment in a bank? And we talked a little about this in the context of capital structure. If a bank has to grow and survive, what do they have to invest in? What's the one number that gets checked every year to make sure you're going to be able to survive as a solvent bank? Your regulatory capital. You're a growing bank, your regulatory capital has to go up. Why? Because you're covered by regulatory capital requirements. If you're an undercapitalized bank, you've got to bring your regulatory capital up or you're not going to go back to being a bank. Do you see where I'm going to go next? Your reinvestment if you're a bank is whatever you need to reinvest in regulatory capital to survive and grow. That's basically what I did for Deutsche in 2013. I took their net income and you can see the net income I'm projecting to turn from, I'm being positive here. My negative net income becomes positive net income in the future. So I go to a profit, 602 million, but they're undercapitalized and they have to make up that deficit. How does it show up? I have to invest $4.6 billion in regulatory capital in year one to get back to where I need to be. You subtract that from 602 million, my free cash load equity is a big negative number. We've already asked this question, might as well ask it again. How much dividend can Deutsche pay next year, if, if, you, if you're in 2013. It shouldn't be paying a dividend, right? Your free cash flow equity is negative. In fact, you look across time, your free cash flow equity are negative in years one, two, and three, which means you have no business paying dividends. And if you think things look bad in 2013, you should see what they look like now for Deutsche. You, as far as the eye can see, I see a negative free cash flow equity. Maybe six, seven years. So if you're investing in Deutsche, expecting dividends to kick in in two or three years, you're, if you're right, you're in trouble. If you're wrong, you're in trouble. If you're right and they actually pay a dividend, they're essentially acting in a way they shouldn't be acting. If you're wrong and you bought the stock for the dividend, you're going to be disappointed because those dividends are not going to come. So if you have a chance and you're interested in banks, take the 10 largest money center banks. Take their net income. You will have to get some 
familiarity with regulatory capital requirements. And S&P Capital IQ actually allows you to download those tier one capital ratios by bank. Look at those ratios. It's going to give you an indication as to whether these banks are in a position to pay the dividends they are. And you know who else is looking at these? You know that if you're one of the banks that were covered by TARP, TARP, not TARP, but TARP as in you know, after the crisis, you were a bank that was helped by the federal government. You no longer have the freedom to set your own dividends or decide how much to buy back in stock. The Fed has to approve any decision you make about buybacks or dividends. So about three years ago, Citi wanted to buy back stock. And guess what the Federal Reserve said? No, you can't do it. And they weren't being mean or negative. They were doing their own version of free cash rate equity, saying you're an undercapitalized bank, you're making money, but you got to get back to a regular capital ratio. If we count how much regulatory capital you need, you're in no position to pay these dividends. The question is, why did the Federal Reserve have to tell you this when you can see it yourself? And that goes to the heart of the insanity of dividend policy, that banks continue to pay dividends in the face of huge regulatory capital shortfalls. And here's what they do. They pay the dividends out through one window, they issue shares out of the other window. It makes absolutely no sense. But I think we need to start thinking about free cash to equity for banks just like we do for regular companies. So let me give you some statistics on what the world looks like at the start of 2017. So here again, I took every publicly traded company in 2016, 42,688 companies that computed the free cash rate equity for every company. It's not rocket science, right? Net income, net cash, so I did the definition. I looked at the cash return, dividends and buybacks. It sounds like a lot of work, but if you go to Capital IQ, this is 25 minutes of downloading and putting into a big Excel spreadsheet and playing with the numbers. And then I compared the cash returned to the free cash rate equity. So let's start with the same companies at the very top. Your free cash load equity is negative. What do we say you should do? Pay no dividends, buy back no stock. And there's the percentage of companies in each market that essentially have negative free cash flows equity and pay no dividends and buy back no stock. These are not all money losing companies. Some of them are high growth money making companies and by the time you bring in the capex and the working capital, so 28% of US companies, 59% of Australian, New Zealand, Can Canadian companies, about 27% overall. <coughs> These are companies, negative free cash flows equity, pay no dividends. You say, why is that statistic so high in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada? Disproportionately large number of natural resource companies, which, which have been losing money for enough time that they've cut back on dividends, they're not buying back stock. The next line is free cash flows equity that are positive, but no dividends and buybacks. This is like Microsoft in 96, right? So what are these companies doing? They're building up cash balances. Again, don't jump on them. This might not be a bad thing to do if they see some investment needs coming in the future. The next line is free cash flows equity that are positive. There are dividends and buybacks, but the dividends and buybacks are less than the free cash flow equity. So these companies are also accumulating cash. Not as much, perhaps, as the companies that are returning no cash, but collectively, you see that middle line, these are the cash accumulators. These are the companies that each year, and this is on an annual basis, are paying out less than they could potentially pay out. And now we get to the insane companies. You have free cash flows equity that are positive, but your dividends and buybacks are higher than the free cash flow equity. I'm perhaps being a little unfair in calling them all insane because some of them might say we're gonna bounce back, it might be a one year deal. If you do this year after year, you're obviously insane. So you have about, and across the world, about 8% of companies that have positive free cash rate equity, but return far more than that. And then you get the bottom of the pile. Negative free cash rate equity companies that for whatever reason insist on paying dividends and buying back stock, and that's about 22% of the global market. And you can see across the world that Japan has perhaps the most dysfunctional dividend policy in the entire world, and here's how it manifests itself. The typical Japanese company, and I mentioned this before, is now about 25% cash and 75% operating assets. Nintendo is 50% cash, 50% operating assets. You're buying a money market fund and a gaming company when you buy Nintendo, and those things happen because you have a dividend policy that no longer makes sense. <laughs> 
So let's go back to this notion of you do this year after year, your cash balance builds up. Sometimes you get away with it, like Microsoft did until 2002, like Apple did till 2011. And sometimes you don't. This is actually a very old example, but it kind of illustrates what happens when some companies accumulate cash and investors notice. For those of you who know the history of Chrysler, Chrysler had a near-death experience in the early 1980s. 1980, 81, it almost went bankrupt. It wasn't quite bailed out, but it was a mini bailout. It kind of survived. And in 1985, it had a new CEO come in, a guy called Lee Iacocca, who turned the company around with a creation that I curse every day when I park anywhere in the country. What did he create that saved Chrysler? The minivan, the, Do the first Dodge Caravan. But give him credit, he turned the company around. So what you have here is Chrysler over the first 10 years of the Iacocca CEO. Essentially each year, here's what I'm tracking. I'm tracking the free cash flow equity, that's a white column and I'm tracking what the company is paying out in dividends and buybacks in the black column. So let's take 1985. They had about 1.5 billion in free cash flow equity and they returned about 200 million. So help me out here. If you have 1.5 billion free cash flow equity, return 200 million, that increases your cash balance by 1.3 billion. So I keep track of this every year. So if you have a company with a big cash balance, this is actually an interesting way to explain it, is actually go back in time and show the, how the cash balance built up. Because again, it's not accidental. So I did this every year. I kept track of the cash balance. And by the end of 1994, Chrysler's cash balance was about eight and a half billion. It sounds like a pittance next to Apple or Microsoft, right? But the eight and a half billion was about 30% of Chrysler's overall value in, 2000, in 1994. And people noticed, in particular one person, a guy called Kirk Kerkorian. Okay. He's still around, he's like 125 years old, I think. But this was when he was a youthful 195 or something. So he noticed and he said, you guys have too much cash. Know what Chrysler's response was? No, we don't. This is like two six-year-olds fighting in the... But this fight was joint. And initially Chrysler's defense was, we're a cyclical company, therefore we should accumulate cash. There's a kernel of truth there, right? Cyclical companies go through recessions. But the, the follow-up question is, do you need eight billion in cash? Is there a way to answer that question using this graph? Is there a recession period in this graph? 1989-90 was one of the more severe recessions for the automobile business. Did Chrysler burn through some cash? Yes, they did. Their cash balance went from about 3 billion to 2.5 billion. So they burnt off a half a billion dollars in cash for a recession that lasted about two years. So let's set up an algebra problem. If the last recession lasted two years and you burned through half a billion in cash, how long would the next recession have to be for you to need 8 billion in cash? I'll let you work out the math. But basically, you're planning for the Great Depression and you're setting dividend policy based on the Great Depression. This is like a guy who goes into his backyard and starts digging every time it rains, saying, this is the big one. I've got to get ready. Let me build an ark right here. You cannot run a company for a worst case scenario. It did not make sense and the markets didn't buy into it. So after about three months of trying, they gave up on that argument. You know what the second argument was? We need the cash in case we have to do a big acquisition. Does this make you feel much better as a Chrysler stockholder that they might have to do a big acquisition? The history of acquisitions is littered with value destroyed, not value created. So that didn't last very long either. Needless to say, about five or six months into this fight, Chrysler finally gave up. Kerkorian had two directors on the board. They paid out about half of this cash as dividends and buybacks. Eventually, they got bought in one of the most ill-fated mergers of all time, or Daimler Chrysler bought, Daimler bought Chrysler, and I don't know who thought it was a great idea to take a quintessential German company and buy a quint and expect it to work out. That didn't work out. Chrysler went back private, now it became part of Fiat. This is like, you know, expedition into no man's land. But this process started with that cash balance accumulating. And guess what? That fight is being played out today in GM and Ford. 
There are investors who are putting pressure on GM and Ford saying, you have too much cash. It's almost like watching the same game play out because you get exactly the same arguments being made. But you can see that the cash balance accumulated here, but didn't get the slack that a Microsoft got or an Apple got or a Google's getting right now for accumulating cash. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to suggest you compute. I'm going to act like the project is moving along. You're going to start to see the nagging emails pick up after today. And you're going to get to a point where you compute the free cash rate equity for you. It's not difficult to do. Open up the statement of cash flows. Just compute the numbers. In fact, one of the things to remember about the statement of cash flows is the signs and the cash flows are already there. You know what I mean by that? When you look at CapEx on a statement of cash flows, are you going to see a positive number or a negative number? You're going to see a negative number. And so when you do a statement of cash flows, don't subtract a negative number because all things... So if you're using a statement of cash flows, you just have to accumulate the numbers. And what you're left with at the bottom is the free cash rate equity. And one of the nice things in the statement of cash flows is they also tell you what dividends and buybacks happen. So you can actually, on a year-to-year -year basis, do what I did for Disney or any other company and see what your company looks like in terms of <coughs> dividend policy. Because once you get that free cash rate equity, here's your framework for what to do next. So let's say you have a free cash rate equity for your company and try to do it over three or five years, some extended period, so you're not getting a one year doing strange things to you. Let's say over that five year period, you have free cash flow equity and cash return. One of three things is going to be true, just as with capital structure. Either your company is going to be one of those very unusual companies that returns exactly its free cash flow equity to its stockholders. I'll give you an example. If any of you are doing Con Ed, Con Ed returns about 98 to 99% of its free cash flow equity to its stockholders. But that's the exception rather than the rule. You're going to have the two other scenarios. One is a company that pays out less than its free cash flow equity as dividends. So they're accumulating cash. And some of them might have accumulated 30, 50, 80, or if you're doing Apple, 250 billion in cash. You're saying, is that okay? It depends on how much you trust the managers of the company. Because in a sense, cash by itself doesn't hurt you as a stockholder. It's just sitting in the company. It's earning a really low rate of return. But guess what? If you or I had that cash, and invest in something riskless and liquid, we'd earn a really low rate of return as well. So when you see a big cash balance in a company, your biggest worry is, what will these managers do with the cash? So the question I'm going to ask you is, do you trust the managers in this company with your cash? And what are you going to look at? You're going to look at the history. Remember that Jensen's Alpha you computed for your stock? That tells you how well your stock has done. Remember that EBA we computed, return on capital versus, that tells you how good the projects are. If you have positive Jensen's alphas and positive returns on capital, exceeding your cost of capital, you're, for, you're more likely, it's not guaranteed, you're more likely to trust the managers of your company. If you have negative Jensen's alphas and your returns on capital are abysmal, you're going to say, I want my cash back, and who can blame you? Do you want these guys using your cash to waste on other projects? Because if you trust managers, you're going to let them hold the cash. I have never believed that companies get punished and jumped on just because they have big cash balances. The evidence is right out there. How many people do you see jumping on Facebook and Google saying you have too much cash? I haven't heard a single person complain. Why? Because they've delivered great returns to their investors. In contrast, when you look at GM and Ford, the reason people are worried about cash balances is for the last 20 years, these companies have earned returns on capital less than the cost of capital. They've had near-death experiences with bankruptcy. I would rather that they not hold my cash and take more bad projects. So if you trust managers with the cash, you're going to let the cash accumulate. If you don't, I think you have every right to say, I want my cash back. This is your cash. Don't let managers tell you any different. You're not being selfish and greedy for saying, I want my cash back. You invest in the company, that cash belongs to you. And if you don't trust the managers, you have every right to ask for that cash back. You're saying, who's going to listen to me? You're right, nobody will listen to you. That's why you're hoping for a Carl Icahn or a Bill Ackman to do this for you. So while you're cursing them for being uncouth and rude and obnoxious, remember, without them, you're helpless. Because when you ask for your cash back, the manager is going to say, no. What are you going to do about it? 
you don't vote on dividend policy, you don't vote on, you vote on who's on the board of directors, and remember we talked about who's on the board of directors. Now let's look at the other scenario. What if your company returns too much cash? Again, I'm going to ask the question, does my company have good projects? Again, I'll look at your historical returns. If you're a company with good projects and you're returning too much in cash, I think you're doing double damage to yourself. Not only are you, you know, pay, paying out what you can't afford to pay out, cash that you don't have, you're also now probably rejecting projects you otherwise should have taken. That cash could have been used in your projects. So if you're a company with good projects, this is going to sound weird. I'm going to ask you to reduce the amount of cash you pay to me. You think, who in their right minds would ask a company to do it? If I feel that my value is being hurt as a company by, by you paying out huge, huge amounts of cash, and I'm thinking about my total investment, I think it makes sense for me to say, hey, don't buy back this much stock. Take some of those great projects. But if you have bad projects, I'm sunk. Because now, I have a company that pays too much in dividends and takes bad projects. Here's my, my worry. If I ask you to cut dividends, you're going to listen right away, right? So this is exactly what I've been waiting for. And then what are you going to do with that cash? You're going to redirect it into your bad projects, and that terrifies me. So if I were to put companies, you know, and, and every company that I look out there on a matrix, here's what my matrix will look like. On one axis, I have whether your projects are good projects or bad projects, maybe by comparing return on capital to cost of capital. On the other matrix, I'm looking to see whether you return more than your free cash flow equity or less. So if you return more, I'm going to treat you as a cash surplus company. If you, I'm sorry, if you return less, I treat you as a cash surplus company. If you return more, as a cash deficit company. If you're a company in this box, where the cash surplus and good projects, I'm going to give you maximum flexibility. So that's why Google and Facebook fall. They've taken great projects. Their stock has done well. They have big cash balances. Nobody gives them any trouble. They can hold on to the cash. But if they move into that cash surplus poor projects, and it doesn't even have to be actual projects, if people perceive that your choices are getting worse, you're going to start to see the pressure build up. And it's amazing how quickly that transition can happen. Apple in 2011 seemed to have accumulated enough trust to be able to accumulate as much cash as they wanted for the rest of time. By September of 2012, a year later, the pressure was building on Apple to return the cash back. It's that quickly that that transition can happen. And if you're a cash deficit company and you have good projects, I'd rather that you take that cash and take the good projects rather than pay more cash out. But again, the worst case scenario is if you have a bad company that pays out too much. Because then you're not sure where to start, right? Because in a sense, you're worried about that cash being used on. So pray and hope your company doesn't fall into that box because there are no good solutions. So let me go back to Microsoft. Okay? By 2002, Microsoft had a $43 billion cash balance. Again, from the perspective of where we are today, that doesn't sound like much, much. But in 2002, that was the largest cash balance ever accumulated by a US company. But there was nobody raising any fuss about it having too much cash. I, uh, I went through equity research reports. I looked at Wall Street Journal articles. Nobody at the end of 2002 or early 2003 seemed to have any issue with what Microsoft was doing. By the end of 2003, though, that same Microsoft was returning $33 billion in a special dividend. Remember we talked about this when tax law changed? What, what do you think changed between the start of 2003 and the end of 2003? Because to me, this was the tipping point where Microsoft went from being the ultimate gro growth stock where everybody trusted Microsoft's management to suddenly not trusting it anymore. One was actually a Justice Department attempt to break, if you remember, there was actually an attempt to break up Microsoft because they viewed it as a monopoly. The second was a series of missteps within the company where they kept introducing new products and they weren't paying off. The tipping point, it took a while to get there, but there seemed to be a point where markets finally said, hey, you know what, you're a two-hit wonder, Office and Windows, we haven't seen anything for 15 years, and maybe we'll never see anything again. And that was, and, but to give Microsoft credit, when that shift in trust happened, they responded almost instantaneously. And my advice to companies is don't fight the market. You can never win. If people don't trust you, you can't keep telling them, trust me, trust me, it doesn't work. You've got to earn that trust back, and the way you do it 
is the same way you make deposits in a bank. You do good things, you take good projects. Over time, you build up trust, and that's what allows you to accumulate dividends. So let me close, close today by looking at my companies. And I want to go back to Disney in 2003. Remember who the CEO of Disney was in 2003? It's Michael Eisner, right? So the reason I say that is I'm going to be Michael Eisner, you're going to be Disney stockholders in 2003. And I'm going to come to you with a proposition. Here's what it is. Between 94 and 2003, Disney had free cash flows equity of $969 million a year. So they could have paid out $969 million. They paid out $639 million. So each year, what am I doing? I'm holding back about $330 million of your cash. Over 10 years, that accumulates to more than three, four, four and a half billion. So I have $4 billion of your cash, and I want to keep it. And I remember it's your cash, so I'm going to tell you I want to keep it, and I'm going to make a really bad case for keeping it. I say, over the last 10 years, here's what I've done for you, or done to you, depending on what perspective you take. I've generated a return in equity about 2% less than my cost of equity. I've taken some pretty bad projects. I've also, over that same period, had a Jensen's alpha of minus 3%. My stock hasn't done well, my projects haven't done well, but I still want to keep your cash. And to, throw, and to add to the mix, I'm a CEO who's treated you like dirt for the last decade while things were going well. This is a kind of no-brainer. But if I asked you, do you trust me with your cash, what's your answer going to be? Why should I? And in early 2003, that's exactly what you saw happening. Investors wanted Disney to return the cash back to the stockholders. This was the start of the revolt against Michael Eisner, saying, we don't trust this guy with our cash. We want the cash back. That was 2003. And if you remember, a couple of years later, Eisner got pushed out. Bob Iger became the CEO. Let's move forward to 2000. So in 2003, one final point I think that made this lack of trust come to the surface was if you go back to about 1996, Eisner made this huge bet where he took $18.5 billion of Disney stockholder money and he bought Cap Cities and he said, trust me, I know what I'm doing. We're going to dominate the airwaves with Air ABC. And at least through 2003, there was no evidence of that acquisition working. So when you see companies make big acquisitions, they're putting the future dividend policy on the table, right? It's like gambling. Because if the acquisition pays out, you got the flexibility to accumulate cash for a generation. But if it doesn't, you've lost it forever. In this case, Disney had lost it at least in 2003. So in 2003, people wanted the cash back. Let's move forward to 2009. Between 2004 and 2009, you have a new CEO, Bob Iger, who turned the policy for Disney from returning less cash to returning more cash than they had as free cash for equity and borrowing money to cover the difference. So between 2004 and 2009, you're drawing down the cash balance. He's responding to the fact, hey, you guys don't trust us. We're going to give you the cash back. We're going to borrow money to make up the difference. We're going to take projects along the way. And the other thing that shifted was, instead of taking projects that earned less than the cost of capital, Disney went back to taking projects that earned more than the cost of capital. And it's Jensen's Alpha went from a negative number to a positive number. You could say it was luck, it could be whatever. But for whatever reason, in 2009, if I'd come to you and asked you the same question I asked you in 2003, which is, do you trust me with your cash? You can see that I have a much stronger case now than I did in 2003. And you're more likely to say, OK, if you guys want to put the money back in, I'm OK with you accumulating cash again. Final twist, let's look at uh, Disney in 2013. Disney continues to earn more than its cost of capital. It has returned to holding back cash. And now again, you can see the question being posed on you. Do you trust us to keep doing this? And you can see how trust is, is fragile, right? It depends on what have you done for me lately. And in fact, if you move through 2016, Disney's actually become weaker over the last three years, partly because its biggest cash machine is starting to shut down. And I'm talking about ESPN, right? I mean, let's face it, all this cash, if you, take, if you go back to the source, Half of the cash that Disney's throwing off is that ESPN cable bill that you and I pay. And as more of us cut, our, cut the cable, that's less cash available to Disney. So it'll be interesting to see what Disney does going forward 
because those cash flows are not flowing through. They still are ambitious and people trust them less now, especially with Bob Iger's travails about I'm stepping down, I'm not stepping down, I'm stepping down, I'm not stepping down, vacuum under him, CEO for the next three years. I think Disney is in a very dangerous place right now in terms of dividend policy, but you can see that dividend policy is very much a function of what I think about managers. Let me do one final example. It took Vale. And I'll show you the, the, the numbers, and you can see already Vale's problem. It's free cash flowed equity. Before that was about minus $1.9 billion a year. Already you can see, before the debt, they didn't have any cash return. Uh, even after that, they had about a billion dollars in cash they could have returned. See how much they actually returned per year? They returned about $19 billion a year. Company with a billion dollars in free cash flow to equity, returning $19 billion a year is not sustainable, right? We all agree this is in, and this is happening year after year. So I'm Vale's CEO, and you're going to be Vale's stockholders, and I'm going to say, look, you know, Look, guys, this is insane. We can't pay the dividends we've been paying. We've got to cut dividends. So sounds like a sensible thing to do, right? But here's the catch. You know, whether you remember in the first few sessions, I described Vale's shareholders as being common or preferred shareholders. Really, voting shares and non-voting shares. You guys in this room are all own the non-voting shares. And in return for giving you non-voting shares, what did I promise you in return? High dividends. So I want to cut dividends, what are you going to demand in return? What should you if you are sensible? You're going to say, I want voting rights. And guess what I'm going to say? No, I'd rather go insane and go bankrupt rather than give you voting rights. It's amazing how often companies put control over having a sane dividend policy. And Brazil has among the worst dividend policies now simply because they're trapped into paying these big dividends because of the need for control and they don't know a way of getting out without giving up control and none of them wants to do it. Okay. So let's, let's finish with the, I know I said I'd finish with that page, but I'll finish with this one instead. Okay. Once in a while as you have elections, people throw out really bad ideas out there. This was during the French presidential election about 10 years ago when Sigourney Royal was running for, uh, not Sigourney Weaver, but Sigourney Royal. Uh, she was running for French president and she suggested that all French companies be required to pay a fixed dividend payout. That every French company be required to pay 40% of its earnings as dividends. Why? Because she said then we can collect more in taxes when people get the dividends. So the answer to this question is obvious, but if you have a mandated dividend payout, what types of companies in your market are you hurting the most? And I'll go through the list. Large companies making money, small companies losing money, high growth companies that are losing money, or high growth companies that are making money. First, the losing money companies are not affected, right? So the, really the question is, are you affecting the big mature companies or the young, young growth companies by mandating a dividend payout? The young growth companies. Why? Because they have negative cash flows. You know who pushed the most for this change? Mature companies, because if they do this, you create a disadvantage and those guys can't make it back. So when you look at policy discussions about dividends, think about what companies can pay out and what effects it'll have when you force companies to pay out dividends. That's it. I will see you on Monday. cash balance to the sum of our free cash flow to equity? Because if not, we're, we're, de we're discounting the interest. It depends on how you computed the free cash flow equity. If you included, if you started with net interest. income uh -huh. with the interest income included in there, then you subtract. Have, exactly. You have to take the interest income out of the free cash flow equity and compute the free cash flow equity from their operating assets, take the present value of that, and, and then have the beta also. Exactly. The debt to equity, we have to take the excess cash. Exactly. Which you already do. If you do a bottom-up beta, just use your operating beta, okay. right? Because you control the process. But you have to separate the cash flows then and keep the cash balance. Thank you. Yes. Okay, sir. Um, I, I didn't arrive in time today, so I didn't come in for the, for the quiz. But I emailed you before 10.30. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. Yep. So, so that means the, 
the percentage will be deferred? Ten per no, no, the percentage will be, the final will be what, 40%. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I signed up for the early exam, and then I was able to change my travel plans. Okay, that's fine. Who should I email because the cells are locked to get my name off the list? Don't worry, because I locked them because people were removing other figure. people from the list and putting their names on. So don't worry, because we have two rooms now. Okay. It doesn't matter. Very right. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So, yep. conceptually speaking, mm -hmm. about dividends, did um, someone like Chrysler, do they hold back paying dividends because there's this public perception that once you start paying, it's kind of... I, I'm confused as to how to think about dividends, because you said maybe when he, a company starts paying them... But in case like Chrysler, would you ever perceive them to be a growth company? No. no so they're, they're, for them, paying dividends okay. is not going to be a signal effect. Facebook pays dividends, mm -hmm. you can start, maybe people start to read a story into it. Okay. So depending on where, where, how much you know about a company, no automobile company is viewed as a growth company. Right. So the fact that they pay dividends is not some signal they're sending. Okay. Yeah. So when companies, auto companies hold cash back, it's usually for a bad year in the future, right? Okay. They're basically saying there could be a recession, we could need the cash. That's legitimate, so you can figure out how much cash you would need to get through a recession and say, you know what, you need to hold enough cash. Right. But let's say that's two billion, you're holding eight billion. Mm -hmm. I'm going to push back and say, okay, hold two billion in cash. Why are you holding eight billion in cash? Right. And then you're in real trouble because the extra six billion, there is no good story you can tell me that's going to trust you with the so six billion. Much, right? It's not just that it's